Hello everyone. This time around I want to address a question. And that question is, do we need consumer protection laws? And what should those laws look like? Now, it might seem self-evident to, to people that consumer protection laws are necessary. But we should always be skeptical of anything that is self-evident, especially since people tend to be very poor judges of actual evidence on things. Uh, humans are very, very well versed in confirmation bias. If we've, once we've formed an opinion, we will look for, th for facts that support our opinion and we will discount facts that go run contrary to that opinion. Uh, and that's why anything that seems self-evident should be questioned critically. However, in this case, I am definitely on the side that consumer protection laws are necessary. What I, I, I am going to eventually argue, though, is that we can't make these laws too strong. We have to strike a balance. Otherwise, we make it impossible for, uh, for anybody to play in the market. Now, first of all, why do we even need them in the first place? Well, it's simply a matter of economic incentives. There is an economic disincentive for a manufacturer to uh, have the consumer's interests in mind. And, and to, to explain that, let's take a look at an example. And that's... And it, it pretty much illustrates the situation uh, perfectly. Suppose you start Widgets Incorporated and you're selling widgets. Now, as the founder, you set up that uh, your company is going to provide excellent customer service. That's how you're going to distinguish yourself among all of the other purveyors of widgets. You might not be the lowest price in the market, but you're going to be low enough that people can afford you. And you're going to make sure that they have a good experience with your products, or at least as good an experience as they can in the case where something goes wrong. So you're going to provide an excellent warranty. Uh, you're going to replace widgets that are defective, all of that. And you're not going to kick up too much of a stink about that. Although in the obvious cases of the consumer breaking a widget deliberately and then trying to return it, or for a replacement or what have you, or cases where it's obviously been abused, you are going to disclaim those situations because otherwise you're a doormat. And quite frankly, you realized ages ago in previous failed ventures that the customer is not always right. But you're still going to subscribe to the customer is usually right. And unless there's some evidence to the contrary, you'll take them at their word. Now, you realize this is going to cost you some uh, because of the occasional bad actor among your customers who's going to manage to return something that isn't defective. And you're going to have to have frontline people that handle the calls from customers when something breaks, you know, to manage the warranty situation. This all sounds well and good, and, and you're off to the races. You get your manufacturing facility up, you get your distribution network sorted out, and you're, you get, get your widgets into the stores or on the website for direct sale, and everything's ticking along nicely. And you're pleasantly surprised that you're actually taking a credible amount of the market share, at least enough that you're turning a decent profit. And you've been able to... Uh, invest that back in the business, improve your manufacturing uh, capabilities, improve your widgets, uh, make them cheaper to produce because of scale, all manner of things. So, and you're ticking along nicely. You're uh, and you you realize that your frontline support department is costing you money, but as far as you can tell, that's a large re portion f uh, of your market shares is holding due to that. Now, 
your larger your larger competitors are starting to get nervous because their market share is necessarily dwindling while yours is growing. So what they do is they don't compete on customer service because that is a cost center. And if they do that, they'll have to raise the price of their widgets. And they know that if they do that, they'll erode their already eroding market share further. So what they do is they look for any possible way to reduce costs so they can sell their widgets lower, reduce the price of their widgets. Now that will often take the uh, form of making their widgets cheaper, uh, cutting corners or something like that, in a way that's not immediately obvious to the purchaser. Uh, and that allows them to cut, cost, to cut the apparent cost of buying it. Now, by the time people realize that these newer, cheaper widgets are breaking at a much higher frequency and they're having to replace them much more often, if you had done nothing and you stayed exactly where you were, your market share would be plummeting because your widgets are now so much more expensive than the other guys that the customers don't understand why. And no matter how much you've explained it through your advertising campaigns and so on, the customers aren't buying it, literally or figuratively. So that means that if you're going to survive because you figured out what your competitor is doing. If you're going to survive in the widget market, you have to take steps. Now, you have two choices. You can either find a way to manufacture your widgets cheaper or reduce your overhead costs. Now, if you're an honest type businessman, you're going to reduce your overheads. Now, once you've reduced the non-customer facing overheads as much as you possibly can without compromising the quality of your widgets. And that is everything in you know, management and, and uh, sales, marketing as much as you can, all of that. Now you're left with two choices. You can cut customer service or you can cut manufacturing quality. So which one are you going to do? Well, first of all, you're going to cut customer service because typically that's going to be a much higher cost on the balance sheet than the actual cost of manufacturing your widgets because you've already been making that as efficient as possible. So you take a look at some metrics on your call center or whatever you have and you find out that, say, the average wait time is to get a response from a customer service representative is five minutes. You know, at, at peak times and a minute or less at lull times. So you take a look at it and you realize that if you let wait times increase to six or seven minutes at peak times, you can cut your customer service staffing by 30%. Let's just say, made up numbers. And if you can cut your customer service staffing by 30%, you realize that you can cut the price of your widgets enough to at least get within competitive of your, your competitors, get back into that same sweet spot in relative price yet you keep making your products at a similar quality. And as a result, your market share starts ticking up again. And most people, because your widgets are decent quality, they don't have to call your customer service people, so, so there isn't any bad, uh, isn't much bad publicity. And besides, people calling at peak times can understand if they get a six or seven minute wait for a customer service representative because they know it's busy and they can understand that. They've been busy. They, they understand how that works. Now, of course, your competitors aren't going to take this lying down. So they're going to go through the same exercise you've done to cut their costs so they can sell their widgets cheaper yet. 
And eventually, they might have started with cutting their manufacturing costs and cheapening their widgets, and then moved on to customer service. Or they might have started with customer service and moved on to, their, to cheapening their widgets. Uh, but either way, whichever one you start with, after enough iterations of this competition pressure, you will eventually both end up cutting both to the point where both of you are making crap and both of you have crap customer service in the absence of any other motivating factor, any other incentive. So this is your free market where there's actual competition. The basic forces will force you to the bottom eventually. At, and eventually you all get so close to the bottom that you're indistinguishable and then whoever has the deepest pockets wins and then you end up with a monopoly left over who can push everybody else around in the, the market and the consumers lose. Okay. Now let's suppose you have something that's more naturally a monopoly and uh, you, you have one right from the start. Well, no matter how altruistic you start out, at some point, you're going to end up looking at the bottom line and going, we need to cut costs somewhere. Whether it's a privately held corporation or a publicly held one, at some point, you're going to have to do something to improve shareholder value. Or at some point, the owners, the shareholders, are going to transition from being altruistic to greedy. And... If that happens, all bets are off and you're going to, it's going to go through the same cost-cutting crap and you're going to end up down at the bottom. So basically, your economic incentives are always heading toward the bottom as fast as they can. So you need to actually do something to uh, counteract that equation. Now, this is why we need some level of consumer protection. Uh, but there's one more insidious side to it. Even if companies are officially offering warranties that are fairly reasonable, the consumer has no way to force a company to honor it because it's not an, a level playing field. The company has bajillions of lawyers. They, they can wave a whole, a whole room full of lawyers at you, and you can't counter that because you don't have the resources to hire one lawyer, let alone an entire legal team, whose entire job, day in, day out, is to look for ways to not pay out, to not cover a warranty, to save the company that money. And that will usually take the, the form of weasel words in a warranty uh, document. You should always read those and make sure you understand them. Because uh, if you start doing that, you're going to realize that the warranties that you think you have on your products, you don't actually have. You'll find that there's usually some wiggle room in there to get them out of any warranty claim, no matter how legitimate. There's usually some sort of wiggle language in there which they, you know, be something at, at our sole discretion or something like that. You, know, like you want to look out for that stuff. But whether you see it there or not, you don't have any recourse. If you want the product, you have to accept the warranty offered. You do not have an option in the matter. So this is why we need some level of consumer protection. Now, what level should that be? Well, obviously... Uh, there needs to be some protection from outright fraud on the part of the manufacturers. Uh, so in our widgets uh, company, the fraud would be selling a widget that's not suitable for the purpose that the widget is theoretically for. That would be a fraudulent uh, operation by the company. And that could include such things as making it so shoddily that it can't work 
for the purpose intended, at least not reliably. So we need some, some, uh, some level of protection there. Uh, now, we have to also recognize that occasionally, even in a perfectly run manufacturing facility, there will be cases where a defect appears. This is the purpose of a warranty. So we can't disproportionately punish a company for a single defect out of 20,000 widgets. We just have to make sure the company treats the consumer fairly and repairs or replaces the widget appropriately. Uh, and we need to have a reasonable time frame during which the customer can demand that warranty. We can't have the company arbitrarily shortening that. So this is where statutory minimum uh, warranty periods uh, come from. And this is where uh, the right to return to the point of purchase it after, within X days comes, that sort of thing. Now, uh, I'm actually in favor of the return something that's defective to the point of purchase uh, notion within some time frame. That's perfectly reasonable. Uh, and then that puts the pressure on the point of sale side of it, the stores that sell the product, to push back on the manufacturers and say, look it, we're getting too many returns on your product. We have to handle these. This is costing us money. So you need to make a better product or we'll stop stocking it and you won't sell it through us anymore. So that's where the putting some pressure on the, the store operators is potentially beneficial because they're the ones that are dealing with the irate customers anyway and a lot of the time. So, so there's something there. But we need to make sure that this, this mandatory return period isn't ridiculously long. Otherwise, we're going to be increasing, like we're going to be putting potentially an unfair burden of support on uh, unrelated third parties, uh, you know, like the store, for instance, being required to support manufacturing defects indefinitely in, in the widgets we're producing in our widgets company. That's unreasonable. Yet, uh, consumer protection rules will tend to have this similar race to the bottom of infinite protection for the consumer and infinite cost for the manufacturer, which will then lead to the manufacturer shutting up shop and taking their toys and going home. Because now they can't possibly make a profit, there's no point even trying. So that's why we need to balance consumer protection with the cost that we place on the people that have to provide the warranty and so on. Now, Requiring, say, statutory minimum warranties or something, that's a slippery slope as well. Is if you make those too long, you're going to artificially increase the cost of widgets. So you need to make certain that you've got some reasonable uh, information behind it. And unfortunately, this sort of thing, one size fits all, isn't really going to work. So for things like automobiles, for instance, Requiring a certain warranty time during which the thing has to be supported by the manufacturer, that is in the multi-year range, is perfectly reasonable because the, the, the product is intended to last for those, for, well, 5 or 10 or 15 years. Yet requiring the same thing from uh, a pair of scissors probably not reasonable. Uh, so this is where it's very difficult to regulate. And uh, this is probably a situation where regulators should pick and choose what sorts of things they regulate. And likely in, in this situation, it will lean toward the higher ticket items where the risk to the consumer is so much more. Uh, like if I buy a pair of scissors and it's defective, but the defect doesn't show for, for six months, and it's now outside of the warranty of, say, 90 days, I'm not really usually out that much. You know, I'm out 10 or $20, maybe. And my risk of that happening is relatively low outside of the warranty period, at least until you get toward the life expectancy of the product. And, you know, so a lot of things 
The warranty will cover the infant mortality period where most manufacturing defects will show up. And then the relative risk to the consumer is fairly low, especially for a relatively simple product like a pair of scissors, which might be the widgets we're making. Um, on the other hand, a car or, or a, a bed or a house or uh, any number of uh, appliances or, or any number of things which have a fairly high ticket price compared to what your typical consumer can afford to lose. These are the things where regulators maybe need to look at stepping in and you know, making things better. And, and this is one area where I think the existing consumer protections in most jurisdictions are woefully lacking. Now, I generally don't agree with, let's just add more regulation to solve the problem. That generally doesn't work. But some well thought out regulation in this field would make a substantial improvement in the overall customer experience. Uh, such things as requiring that big ticket items be repairable as opposed to junk them and replace them type uh, situations. Or that they be made durable so that they have to last 10 or 15 years, like with appliances. Instead of making appliances that have to be replaced every three years, let's, let's force manufacturers to make appliances that will last 10 or 15 years and force them to support every product, every product in that marketplace for that length of time. Make it a level playing field so everybody has to support the products for that same length of time. And if you make it so that they have to be repairable and repairable by third parties, even if the manufacturer goes defunct, that is, that it's possible to make new parts uh, by someone competent enough in aftermarket, you know, that sort of thing. If we go back to making big ticket items repairable, maybe they have a higher price than they have now, but they last three times or four times or five times as long, and it becomes cost effective to repair them when they break, and possible to repair them when they break, if we reduce, you know, then we'll see a much better consumer experience. But this is going to have to come from above by fiat, by regulation, because the incentives are all completely against that happening. Now, granted, there is an outside chance that it, will, it could happen spontaneously, but it's so vanishingly unlikely that it definitely needs some regulation to force it. Now, I'm talking about appliances here, but this applies to everything. Uh, if we require uh, automakers to support their, their products, their cars, with proper fixes and updates and everything for 15 years from the date of purchase, uh, or or the date of manufacture, or what have you, uh, including, uh, you know, not necessarily supporting things in warranty, but support things so that uh, at least it can be repaired outside of the warranty period, even if it requires purchasing parts or something like that. I think we'll see a market shift in the way things are done and consumers will be a lot better off uh, and I think overall uh, it'll be beneficial possibly to the economy as a whole. It might not look so in the short term but uh, it will give us a much stabler and more more sustainable uh, you know, durable goods type uh, economic situation. Uh, and quite frankly, it'd be much better for the environment if we stop making disposable crap. So 
you know, this is one a major area where the environmentalists are falling down as well. They're not they're not crying for proper you have to be able to repair stuff instead of throw it out uh, legislation and so on, which would go a long way to improving pollution and so on. They're not they're not crying for that, and they probably should be. So this could potentially not only be good for consumers, but it could also be good overall long term uh, for humanity at large, for the environment, for any number of things. And if it means that our everyday products go back to being simpler, like, I mean, who needs a smart light switch? A simple switch works perfectly well for turning a light on and off. So we need to stop this race to ever more complex and ever lower quality. And the only way it's going to happen is with some consumer uh, protection regulation. Now, we do need to make sure that we don't take this too far. Uh, we can't make the manufacturers infinitely responsible for something that they sell because obviously that's not not sustainable for the manufacturer. That is going to uh, put a massive unfunded liability on these companies and the longer the company's been around the, and the more they've sold, the larger that unfunded liability. So there, we can't make these requirements infinite. But we have to make sure that there is a sufficient time frame during which they have to support their, their widgets and during which they have to still sell replacement parts. And if we require them to, when they de discontinue a set of parts, to make it possible for third parties to manufacture those, set, those parts if there's a demand for it, if we do things like that, will improve things immensely without putting a particularly undue burden on the manufacturers. Now, I should clarify that I'm talking about durable things here, actual things, uh, and not so much software or intangibles. But insofar as these durable things have software as part of them, that software would have to be maintained as well. Uh, but I'm not saying that the same rules that we apply to actual tangible things would be appropriate for intangibles. Now, that's a different discussion altogether. And there, there's some slightly different economics involved, but it's still a disincentive for manufacturers or, or sellers to support their product. So we have a similar problem, but the... Uh, the solution is actually significantly different, I think. Uh, at least with physical products, it's easy to determine if the thing works or it doesn't. And, and that's a key. Anyway, uh, so that's basically my point is we need some level of consumer protection law, but we need to make sure we don't go too far with it or we're going to have a deleterious effect on the thing, very thing we're trying to improve. Anyway, that's enough for this time. So if you like this video, or you didn't, leave a like or a dislike. It won't bother me either way. I don't measure my self-worth based on likes or dislikes on YouTube videos. Uh, if you want to be notified of future videos, make sure to subscribe and uh, enable notifications. Uh, otherwise, you won't get notifications. Go figure. And if you've watched this far, thanks for watching.